Hey, Erica, welcome to the Gucklow Reset Program. I'm so, so excited to have you over these next two months, um, two months to start and see how we're doing. But I, I am just so glad that we are already making some great realizations and just you knowing that this has not been your fault for all these years. You know, there has been something underlying going on that um, sadly, a primary doctor will not catch that if they don't specialize in anything related to GI. I often see even GI doctors overlook this because this is something that can be an, um, under an umbrella term for IBS, um, which is called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that a lot of GI doctors are just not caught up on with the research. So I'm just really glad that you know, we can figure this out and hopefully we can even get you a GI doctor referral to possibly confirm the testing. Um, and we can, you know, we could see, you can try to get a GI referral and you could see how long the wait time is. So we can, you know, assess whether we're going to wait for that or not, or we can even get going with treatment, which I have done in the past based on clinical assessment and symptoms. So we can see, you know, what um, goes on with you getting the GI appointment and we'll go from there. But let me flip my screen around and I will show you your welcome packet, which is about 40 pages. It is pretty long, so I'm not going to go over every single page, but it is laying out your entire plan, you know, your recommendations, your clinical assessment, your goals, um, and just so much information. So I'll share my screen with you and we'll go over some of the major pages, major points, of course, and your recommendations. Okay. So like I said, you, this is your welcome packet. You will get this PDF in your document section in Healthy. So you'll have everything you'll be able to download just like all your other documents. So just ignore the four month because I know we're doing the two for a little bit. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions about Healthy. You seem to be pretty good at it already with journaling, logging food, definitely can log your water intake. You can set a water goal in healthy as well. And we'll talk about your water goal recommendations. Um, you can, you, you'll obviously be getting notifications like you are in healthy. Um, you'll be getting a bi-monthly check-in form in addition to our two live group coaching calls every month where we check in and we do touch base one-on-one -on -one during those calls. You know, everybody kind of chats a little bit about how they're doing and we talk about barriers and successes and wins and struggles. Um, we usually talk about a help, gut health topic as well. So we get some education, you get some feedback, but we'll also be doing a one-to-one -one bi monthly check-in that will just be you and I chatting one-on-one -on, -one on Healthy Messenger. So you'll also be at that time, we'll up, be updating your roadmap. So you get additional recommendations, additional notes to help support you with where you're at. We'll fine tune your goals a little bit during that time as well. Um, you can also, if you're not sure, you can access the um, the live calls via Healthy, via the Zoom calendar, like the Healthy calendar with this session will be on there. I'm probably going to put in, I usually put in the session for like the next week, like I'll put in the one for next Wednesday, probably tomorrow morning. So it will be automatically triggered on your calendar. And then you can click the link right from Healthy. And I often put the link as well in the Facebook group ahead of time. So you can just click, click from there as well. So the more you journal, the more you'll get out of the program. So I recommend journaling, journaling at least three times a week and one weekend day. So I can kind of see both and I can best serve you, you know, I, the more that I can see, the more I can give you feedback on and we can fine tune things like the more symptoms that I see, the more I can troubleshoot things with you as they arise. Um, you can always post menus if you like in the Facebook group, post questions in the Facebook group as well that relate to, you know, labs um, like SIBO, clinical diagnosis recipes, elimination diet, things like that, that are more general that other people in the program can benefit from. Otherwise, one-to-one -one stuff we'll talk about more in your bi-monthly check-ins as well. You can also post notes in your healthy journal with anything extra that you want me to know for that week or, you know, anything else that you just want to, um, you know, anything basically that you want me to know that you can just add in as a note and you can also be doing food, um, obviously water, approximately portion sizes, 
You can put in your hunger and satiety levels and how you felt afterwards, any symptoms that come up. You can rate your bloating on a scale of one to 10, if you like, with 10 being severe or distension. And our goal is obviously that we're going to see way less and less than that throughout the program. So I'm excited for you to get started. I'm going to send you also this health vision form, which will be via your email. Um, you'll also have it pop up a lot of times if it's a new um, form from your module section, it will say you have a new module available. So always click that because that might sometimes be a new form to complete like a health vision form or a bi-monthly check-in form. So definitely important to note that. And this I usually send around day seven. So, you know, next week you'll get this health vision form, just reflecting on what it, what does having good health mean to you? What is it? Why is this important to you? And what will keep you coming back to yourself and keeping yourself motivated on this journey? And I know you've been dealing with these issues for so long. So I know you're definitely ready to tackle them, get to the root cause and really get rid of these symptoms for good. And again, we'll make these SMART goals in, in your roadmap. So we'll both be able to fine tune them and make them realistic, measurable, and attainable. This is a little bit about we are what our gut bacteria eat. So we'll definitely be diving into a whole topic on this on one of our calls, but we know that the food that we eat is basically information for our gut bacteria. So we can feed it disease promoting foods all the time, or we can, we can feed it disease, you know, fighting foods and it's not black and white, you know, there's definitely a spectrum and there's definitely, you know, we don't want to feel like we have to be clean eating hundred percent of the time, or else we're going to have a bad gut. We just want to, you know, think about what we're eating most of the time, right. And how we can balance our plate to promote, um, lower inflammation, reduce, um, any weight loss resistance, improve gut inflammation, improve insulin sensitivity, which is basically improving that blood sugar number, improving lipid metabolism, because the way our microbiome is comprised of that affects our lipid and fat metabolism, which affects our weight. So we want to be feeding it different things like prebiotics, probiotics, fiber, different diversity of fiber, like veggies, fruits, nuts, seeds, herbs, polyphenols, resistant starches, fermented foods, all these things we'll be talking about in the program. And we'll be talking about what specific fibers will be good for you The time in the time being. We really want to make sure that we're not instigating the bacterial overgrowth right now. So we'll do a temporary elimination diet of certain carbohydrates that actually trigger that bloating, that pregnant looking bloating that you're getting. And we'll just do a temporary elimination of them while we're working on getting rid of the problem and addressing root cause issues. So we'll be using specific prebiotics and probiotics throughout the program through different stages of healing. We also want to be watching our sugar intake, especially because I think you have some candida like fungi overgrowth growing on. So refined sugar can increase candida saturated fat and excess like conventional meats and proteins. I know you're definitely um, from what you've told me, you're definitely really conscious of that with getting like more grass fed and wild salmon, which is amazing because that difference in fat component really does affect the microbiome. Um, we, we know the antibiotics is a huge killer for the microbiome. And I think that's something that's contributed, contributed to your microbiome imbalance over the years in the large intestine, um, and contributed likely towards SIBO. PPIs and antacids because we're lowering our stomach acid, which we don't want. We really want nice, healthy stomach acid levels, which we will work on together. Um, and when we have lots of these negative factors that can lower our short chain fatty acid production, which is basically like the rewards for eating fiber. We had, when we have good bacteria that feed on fiber and produce metabolites, these beneficial metabolites are called short chain fatty acids, and they are amazing for improving our metabolic health, reducing our glucose levels and insulin resistance, reducing inflammation, improving our metabolism. So we really want to have high short chain fatty acid production and low LPS, which is a bacterial endotoxin. So the way we can do that is also by weeding out some of the bad bacteria. When we weed out bacteria that increase that endotoxin production, we get lower toxin production, right? We could reduce gut inflammation. And then we are work, obviously working on your stool consistency and insulin resistance. 
So these are some factors that negatively affect the gut. Overall, we have stress, which we'll definitely be harping on a lot in this program because we cannot heal our gut fully without healing our adrenal glands. And I feel like your adrenal glands have been very taxed over these last 20 years, like you've said, being on um, the copper IUD, um, just being going through a lot of antibiotics, getting food poisoning. There's just a lot that happens in life, right? That can affect our physiological stress that then raises the stress in the body, basically, that your adrenals don't really feel safe enough for weight loss and that it's holding on to excess weight. Um, especially with SIBO, which puts a high stress load on the liver and the adrenal glands. So getting rid of that will also be a lot, um, you know, stress relieving on the body. We know antibiotics and NSAIDs like ibuprofen are really, um, dam damaging to the microbiome and the gut lining. The gut lining is also impaired likely, which is something we're going to be focusing on. Um, we also know that BPAs, plastics, bottles, and storage containers uh, are damaging the micro, micro <laughs> microplastics are damaging to the gut lining and the gut microbiome. So you want to be using, if you can, more glass, stainless steel, um, and definitely not be microwaving any plastic and trying to maybe use a glass water bottle, which would be great. Oral contraceptives and copper IUD have both shown to be impactful, impacting on the microbiome and they raise the risk of SIBO and bacterial overgrowth. They also can raise the risk of gallbladder dysfunction, which may have been an influence back then. Um, Cause I think, I'm not sure, but I don't know if those overlapped, but let me know about the, about when you, you know, when you're on birth control, or if you ever did hormonal birth control before the copper IUD, or if you just went right to the copper IUD, I'm not totally clear on that. We know that imbalanced microbiome contributes to poor microbiome health, of course, because we want a higher level of good bacteria versus bad bacteria. So it seems like right now the bacteria in the large intestine are out of displacement. They are a little bit out of balance, which contributes to symptoms. And gluten and conventional dairy can be a problem for some in the microbiome, but we, we, I don't tend to see this often. I tend to see it more as a carbohydrate intolerance because of SIBO and IBS. So we won't be doing, we won't be doing gluten-free, um, but we will be doing lactose-free for sh a short period of time because the lactose carbohydrate has been shown to be, um, very fermentable and causing symptoms when it comes to SIBO. We also know processed vegetable oils that are everywhere and processed foods are really damaging to the microbiome and raise inflammation. So we just want to be mindful of this or kind of in everything, but there are a lot of snacks and alternative products that don't have lots of sunflower oil and canola and um, soybean oil, all of these high omega-6 vegetable oils. So we really want to be focusing on just reading labels and using um, products that have less of these inflammatory vegetable oils in them and have more avocado oil, olive oil, and omega-3 fats. So three phases, um, we'll definitely be doing majority of phase one, to, one and two together. I don't I would say even maybe like two, we might, if you stop at month two, you might not fully get to phase two with me, but I would direct you on how to continue. Um, but I would love, obviously love to continue, you know, working with you to say on the plan and make sure that your gut is healing appropriately. So I'll have you watch the balanced meal formula as well this week on balance meals for a healthy gut to basically watch a video lesson to help build your meals. In addition, I have a, also in the PDF down below, I have a meal formula that really will, ex will expand on that in the balanced meal video. We'll create a guided elimination plan with an emphasis on diversity of plants, even on a, what's called a lower FODMAP, lower in these fermentable carbohydrate diet. We still want to focus on a high diversity of plant foods because that really just is correlated with a healthy gut when we have a diverse intake of foods. And it sounds like you really do like a diverse range of vegetables, which is amazing and fruits. So I don't definitely don't think that would be a problem. Um, we also will be just allowing the immune system then when we're on this elimination diet to kind of suppress from its heightened state, reduce the inflammation, provide you with symptom relief while we then focus on addressing root cause issues. So the temporary diet changes are not healing the problem. They are just improving, reducing inflammation and improving symptoms while we tackle the issues. 
We'll be talking about some supplement recommendations based on your targeted needs and your individual plan. And we'll have different supplements that are recommended at different points of the healing journey, because we kind of want to build on the progress that we're making. We'll also then um, go review a reintroduction phase to pinpoint your FODMAP carbohydrate triggers. And then what you would do if you are sensitive to any of them still, you basically would take more of the antimicrobial and then you, you'll reintroduce it back on the back end, basically. But I will, you know, direct you at that time with what to reintroduce when, but we want to make sure that you're feeling really good first and you have a really good solid base of symptom relief before doing reintroductions. And then our goal is that you're really not going to have any restrictions. You're going to be able to have a balanced way of eating that's gut healthy, that's promoting healthy blood sugar regulation and without symptoms and your SIBO bacterial overgrowth will be gone. So that is our goal. Um, and really, you know, we'll be honing in on those individual challenges and barriers to your long-term success. But our goal is, again, is that you won't need to rely on supplements long-term to stay well. You know, there are some certain supplements that I do recommend keeping for optimal wellness in your routine long-term, but we don't want you to be relying on anything on anything long-term to not be bloated. So that is the goal. Okay. So your overall assessment. So I did write down your current weight that you told me 200, your ideal body weight based on height. And I think your initial goal of weight of 170 to 175 is awesome. I think focusing on gut health first and gut healing is really going to make the best progress and in, in weight loss as well, because your metabolic health is affected by what's going on in the gut. And actually I did write in this bullet point here, one of them down below, I think just how you actually extract more calories from your food when you have a bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, which is crazy. So you, I know you're saying you've been eating really healthy, you've been working really hard. So it's not you, it's what's going on in your gut. That's increasing your calorie intake basically. So I think you have a high, high likelihood of hydrogen SIBO. There are three gases possible. You do fit the picture more of hydrogen. There's hydrogen, methane and hydrogen sulfide. So I also think you may have some CFO, but there is no test for fungal overgrowth. You do just have a lot of fungal symptoms, um, which I'll get to. And this is evidenced by the severe bloating that you have, the gas belching. So SIBO gas can go back up and it can go down. So it goes both ways. Um, I know you some, sometimes you said you have intermittent constipation, but mostly you're having like pretty normal to loose serbiums, I think you said in your roadmap. Um, and just having the constipation, sometimes that can typically be caused by SIBO because SIBO can affect our gut motility up in the small intestine. And I do think this was caused by a few different factors. So I think it was affected by the long-term copper IUD. We know excess copper is absorbed into the body and that actually increases risk of SIBO and candida overgrowth. So I think that may have been part of the problem over like the long period of time you've, you've had the copper ID in, IUD in, and I do think it was affected by the gallbladder removal way in the past as well, which increases risk of SIBO. Bile is antimicrobial. So we don't have a lot of well, you know, um, basically lots of like bile that's being um, excreted sorry, at your meals that can lead to bacterial overgrowth. And we don't have that sufficient flow of bile at each meal. So, um, I do also think food poisoning played a role eight years ago. I think that it was already kind of brewing and that the damage migrating motor complex from food poisoning that happens, the migrating motor complex are the cells in the small intestine. So what happens with food poisoning is that it can cause kind of an autoimmunity against those MMC cells in the gut, which can set the stage for SIBO development. So it might've perpetuated it. Maybe if it was already brewing, it kind of might've been like the straw that broke the camel's back. In addition to antibiotics throughout the years, excess copper, gallbladder removal, possibly lower stomach acid as well over time. I know your baking soda test was, you know, you didn't burp um, with the baking soda acid test. You said you belch after eating, you have upper stomach bloating, and all these are signs of lower stomach acid. So we really want to, we'll be focusing on supporting your stomach acid and increasing it naturally because we really want to make sure you're having good digestion from the top down and our, and our digestion starts in our upper stomach, right? We really want to have good, healthy stomach acid levels. So that will also help reduce the 
basically the the particle size of food that is entering our small intestine, right? If food is more broken down, when it gets to the small intestine, it's not going to cause as much trouble if it's in smaller pieces. I also think because of the gallbladder removal, you said you had a history of gallstones, the liver is stressed out. And this also is, it happens with SIBO as well. So liver takes on a lot of the load of what's going on in the gut. So SIBO increases load on the liver. You have probably some bile sludge. If you're having, if you had past gallbladder removal with gallstones, the bile could be sludgy and not flowing really well. So we have a whole liver and gut um, video that I'll have you watch as well. And we'll talk about liver health. Um, and I, like I said before, that's an opportunity for SIBO to overgrow when you have low bile flow with gallbladder removal. And it does seem like you have poor fat digestion sometimes because you've had like some mild diarrhea going on. So that also improves with eradication of SIBO because SIBO also impairs fat digestion. So a lot of these things are like a catch 22 where one precedes the other. And by us tackling what's going on in the gut, you're going to be helping to relieve a lot of these issues and open up a lot of these pathways. So we know there's large intestinal dysbiosis from this clinical assessment um, with a little bit of candida fungal overgrowth. And I think get, getting back that stool test will be really helpful for us and see which pathogens are high, you know, what we need to focus on, what probiotics are high or low, so any of those metabolites that we want to look at in the gut that are high or low. So that will really be helpful when you get that back. But a lot of your symptoms, like your history of UTIs, those are influenced by candida overgrowth in the gut, itchy scalp and ears, bloating gas, having oral thrush. It's basically like a fungal overgrowth on the tongue. So this is affected by a lot of these things we've been talking about as well. So we're that's also going to be a target of intervention. We, I do use something that covers both candida and fungal overgrowth in the large intestine, as well as um, improving the small intestinal bowel overgrowth. I do think it's great that you're going to be taking that MP thyroid, that desiccated thyroid supplementation. Um, oh, I, I didn't update this after we talked today, but I know your T4 and your TSH. So your T4 was low and your TSH was high. So because it's borderline, it would really be considered like subclinical hypothyroidism. It's really not even that borderline, but I know your primary doctor said really you didn't have a problem, but many doctors have so many different reference ranges, which is crazy, but for optimal wellness and the fact that you're having all these metabolic issues and gut issues and weight loss issues, if I, I don't know, I think I said that already, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's been a long day. Um, hypothyroidism is definitely present. So I think taking that desiccated thyroid supplementation, it's a natural blend of T1, 2, 3, and 4, which is better than taking just Synthroid um, because T4, it, Synthroid is basically T4 by itself, and that really isn't great for gut health either. And that's been shown actually on its own as that's why even that's one of my questions on that bacterial overgrowth form is have you ever taken Synthroid for a long period of time? Because Synthroid alone can raise your risk of SIBO. So I don't recommend taking Synthroid. I recommend taking desiccated thyroid. So you're getting a natural blend of all four of these thyroid hormones. So I think that's really going to make a difference when it comes to addressing root cause of SIBO because hypothyroidism is actually a risk factor of SIBO as well, because it slows down the upper gut. So that's basically a, a root cause that we're addressing in addition to eradicating the SIBO bacteria. We're going to be focusing on gut permeability, which is always present with SIBO, which is basically like a leakiness in the gut where there there's food bacteria and toxins getting through like between the cells in the intestinal lining, instead of being absorbed properly through the cells, food and bacteria are like leaking out into the bloodstream. And this over time increases inflammation. It can create over a very long period of time. It can increase the risk of autoimmune disease. It raises um, just systemic inflammation and reduces our metabolic health. So we really will be focusing on that as well by eradicating SIBO and focusing on gut lining support. We know that we you do have a little bit of prediabetes going on. We have also seen that be influenced by excess copper in the body over time. So I know you've been working really hard with your diet. So we can obviously, we'll be fine tuning your balanced meals and all the 
um, obviously reviewing your journals and looking at where we can improve your blood sugar regulation. But I also want you to know that it could be due to the excess copper that you had going on for a long period of time and the SIBO bacterial overgrowth. We also saw in your lab work, we saw these altered nutrients related to SIBO and related to altered absorption when it comes to SIBO bacteria. We know low iron, low ferritin, low iron saturation are all affected by SIBO as well as low B12, high LDL and cholesterol, um, low vitamin D. So a lot of these are SIBO related. We just also want to be focusing on good balance meal hygiene and meal, the meal formula that I'll talk about. So I'm really expecting to see these really improve. And you can definitely take a look at this lab chart here as well. I did highlight in yellow some of the things that I do recommend getting done. Um, this upper level is the GI doctor. And I just wrote out some of your home tests as well. I do think you should rule out celiac disease. It would be good to get a fecal calprotectin test to rule out like a screening tool for IBD, such as Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. So I don't think you need a colonoscopy right now, but I do think it would be good to get that screening tool. And I would love him to do the SIBO breath test. And so we could see, you know, one, when you would get an appointment and two, if they would even test for it. Um, so that would be like a hurdle we would need to cross. I did highlight some other things as well. We want to focus on increasing your potassium intake. And I wrote some food choices here. I did highlight the anemia, the A1C being high, the blood sugar, high blood sugar. We would want to see also the fasting insulin, which would be good. And a lot of these, let's see, like your even copper would be good to see because you had the excess copper, um, you know, in the past with the copper IED in for so long. And I would love to see these inflammatory markers like CRP, sedimentation rate and homocysteine, as well as estrogen, progesterone, DHEA and testosterone. I think you said it was, the estrogen was low in the past, but I don't know what cycle, you know, what phase of your cycle you were in when the labs were drawn and it's dependent on that. So maybe you can clarify that for me, um, like what cycle you're in, or if you definitely know that estrogen was low for that reference range. And I would actually love to see even too, like in a morning cortisol level, which is your stress hormone that comes from your adrenal glands that we believe to be a little taxed right now with everything going on in the gut. So let me know if you have questions about your lab sheet. We'll obviously be updating it when you get new lab work. I think you were set, said you were sending me them today. And here is what I was kind of just saying about cortisol. So I think there's some adrenal dysfunction going on due to the chronic stressors on the body with SIBO, dysbiosis. Copper is even disruptive to the adrenal glands, which produce that stress hormone cortisol. So the dysregulation of cortisol can actually even cause other copper toxicity symptoms um, when there is that, you know, adrenal dysfunction present. So we're going to be focusing on adrenal support, mineral support. We want to be focusing on specific minerals that, uh, that support the adrenal function to improve your cortisol response in the body, stress resiliency, and your gut health. So the four R's are basically just how we address SIBO, reducing fermentable carbohydrates, calm down the inflammation, eliminate the bacterial overgrowth using herbal formulas. We don't like to use antibiotics, which have a high relapse rate and antibiotics like rifaximin, do, which is what doctors will use for SIBO, do not address fungi. And we know you have fungi in there. We know you have fungi issue going on and it, the rifaximin can make fungal overgrowth worse. So that's where your case would be good for herbal antimicrobials that target pathogenic bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses, and it leaves good bacteria intact. We also will um, repair the damage to the intestinal lining, lining restore the gut permeability, restore motility of the GI tract, and work to restore beneficial bacteria in the large intestine, reduce candida, and have a healthy and well-balanced microbiome. These are some of those additional testing I was talking about a few slides ago. So definitely check those out. See, We'll see what you got done now, and we'll see what we can get done in the future.
These are some goals that I've been talking about, plant diversity, especially on low FODMAP and beyond. We want to have a diverse range of plant foods in our diet to promote gut resiliency long-term, eradicate bacterial overgrowth, rebalance the gut microbiome in the large intestine, really look at all different possibilities and reasons SIBO may overgrow. And that's, you know, what we just discussed that a lot above, um, also be focusing on vagus nerve function because the gut brain access is very, very relevant here. We know that the vagus nerve, it, it basically runs from the gut to the brain. It supports our motility, our anxiety, our mood, our, you know, our microbes are talking all the time to our brain. So we really want to make sure that we're targeting the vagus nerve in a great way. Um, we want to support bile flow and healthy, um, not gallbladder function, but a healthy bile function. Um, because there's still bile ducts that gallstones can get stuck in just because you don't have a gallbladder doesn't mean you basically can't have gallbladder problems because it's the same. It can form in the same way. There's just no gallbladder to get stuck in. It basically, I've seen also clients have gallstones in their bile ducts where then it can block the bile flow just the same. So we really want to be supporting healthy levels of bile flow, optimizing stomach acid, optimizing your motility. Um, reducing gut inflammation and gut permeability, which affects fatigue. So I think that's playing a big role there, especially between gut permeability and adrenal health. The fatigue is a big thing that I know you said you're struggling with. We really want to be re also reducing the stress bucket in an environment um, just to promote healing as best we can, because our liver is taking on the load of everything that's around us every single day. So we want to, like I talked about before, using more glass and stainless steel, getting rid of like toxic nonstick pans, switching to more non-toxic beauty and skincare, safer non-toxic household cleaners. I have a whole Amazon list that opened up today for you that says shop my Amazon storefront and I have a whole non-toxic living section. So definitely check that out. Just as things run out, you can replace with more non-toxic products. Just thinking of how you can detoxify your life just to help your liver and your gut health just work a little bit less hard every single day. So your water intake goal is about a hundred ounces of water based on your weight um, and just our gut healing goals. We want to also replenish minerals that will aid in the intermittent constipation that you have sometimes. And just, it's really good for your adrenals to have these mineral drinks. So even there is an adrenal cocktail powder, which I have here, which is like an all-in-one, or if you don't want to add to the supplements right now, you could just do the mineral mocktails that I have in a PDF for you. So check out that recipe PDF. It's called like minerals, mineral adrenal cocktail recipes. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the minerals and it's basically, um, you're getting lots of potassium and high quality sodium and vitamin C to improve that adrenal health, which these are the ingredients and minerals that are most depleted when our adrenals are taxed and they're most depleted in our current society due to stress, digestive upset, even depleted soils. So you can also use LMNT packets, which I like. Um, they're also on my Amazon page and I usually recommend about a half a packet at a time, um, but those are also really great for mineral rehydration, great for energy levels that really will help your fatigue. And again, really help out gut health and adrenal health. So let me know if you get to try one of those mineral drinks. One of the main components is like coconut water, maybe a splash of pineapple juice or pomegranate juice. So they're actually really tasty and you can even make it with like lime juice. There's a few different recipes on there. So let me know if you try one. So this is your recommended plan. We want to do that lower FODMAP short-term elimination diet for five to six weeks or more as needed, depending on how you're feeling. We don't want it to be super strict. We just want enough swaps to help relieve symptoms, reduce irritation before we do the planned reintroduction of FODMAP groups while we're basically treating SIBO, clearing it, focusing on root causes, focusing on optimizing all of your digestive checkpoints. I listed some apps here that are really helpful for low FODMAP. I also have a whole low FODMAP video that I'll have you watch probably within this next week, just so you can ask me questions whenever you need to. Um, you do 
you probably will do better also with more cooked roasted steamed grilled veggies over lots of like big raw salads. Um, but you, you typically, we typically see like spinach and arugula being generally well tolerated, like soft greens, like soft salad greens or spring mix. So it's really on an individual basis. Um, I listed some low FODMAP, high fiber foods to feed beneficial bacteria and promote really good bowel movements. Um, we want to increase certain foods that help reduce fungal overgrowth and because they're hot, it's high with UTIs. So I'm going to show you on the next page, I have like an anti candida grocery list and we want to be reducing even like refined grains, starches, white carbs, sugar. I don't think you eat a ton of to this, just a reminder um, that these foods increase candida overgrowth. So you want to be careful with those. We'll focus on foods that support digestion and bioflow, like bitter foods and lemon, lime, grapefruit, arugula, spinach, kale, dandelion root tea is one of my favorites, um, watercress, broccoli sprouts, lots of healthy fats, really, really great for gallbladder. And I mean, I keep saying gallbladder, we don't have one. the bile flow and liver detoxification and the congestion in the liver that happens with SIBO. We also want to be focusing on iron rich, low FODMAP foods. So I listed a few different sources here, and I will be making a recommendation to help increase your iron levels in the meantime, while we treat SIBO. I listed some omega high omega-3 fatty acid foods, which are excellent for gut health. And we want to be focusing on those three balanced meals every day using the meal formula. And you do want to avoid skipping meals when you're bloated. This can make bloating worse and actually can reduce your digestive capacity over time, lower stomach acid, lowers your pancreatic enzymes. So I know it can be hard when you're like very bloated, but you still want to have even like a small balanced snack. Um, you ideally want to have a few hours between meals so your food can clear out of the small intestine with that MMC. So when we're not eating, we have those space between meals that MMC is allowed to clear out and clear out food and bacterial particles. So it's nice to have that small digestive rest window between meals. Um, so that's why it is important to get those three balanced meals that are pretty, um, you know, filling and satiating because we do want to have a few hours in between. And you ideally don't want to eat two to three hours before bed to avoid food sitting in the small intestine and fermenting overnight. But you do want to listen to your hunger cues. If you're very hungry, you know, have a snack, have a balanced snack if you can with some carbs, some protein, some healthy fat. I do have a whole snack list in this packet as well. This is a little bit more about candida and the signs of fungal overgrowth, which you definitely had a lot of them. This is that grocery list for candida. I did make some adjustments for lower FODMAP um, because this isn't a low FODMAP list, but I have a lot of you know little recipes and things like that that can help you boost these foods in your diet. And you can let me know what you think you'll like more of versus others. And here are your supplement recommendations. So I will be sending you the two supplements to treat SIBO as part of your program. So like I said, we can either wait till you get a GI appointment to possibly confirm it, or we can move forward depending on how long, you know, it would take for you to get a GI appointment, but we, I, you know, that will be included in the program. And then these are some supplements below that I will be recommending to you initially to jumpstart your gut health journey along with your diet changes to really help you one, have really much better digestion, improve your symptoms. A trantal is great because it's a, an herbal formulation that assists the antimicrobial biotics regimen and actually improving the gut flora in the small bowel. So it addresses symptoms as well as addressing the root cause issue, which I love. It has a lot of clinical evidence the HCL pancreatic and bile enzyme supplement with a meal temporarily. This will be really great initially for improving symptoms, reducing your bloating, really helping your digestion from the top down, really providing that bile that's needed at meals. And that's even like impaired with SIBO. Um, and that will help reduce the fermentation of carbs in the small intestine and ultimately reduce SIBO symptoms as well. And we want to be doing a high quality multivitamin with minerals because you have low B12, you're low, you're likely low on a lot of other B vitamins because SIBO reduces their absorption. We also want the zinc in there for gut healing. We like the selenium in there for the thyroid. So we just want to be covering our bases with minerals um, and vitamins that can be impaired with SIBO in the gut that can, that can 
impact our absorption of nutrients. I'm also recommending a grass-fed beef liver supplement to help that iron level naturally. We I don't love synthetic iron because it's oxidized easily by bacteria and can contribute to systemic inflammation. So grass-fed beef liver does have naturally occurring iron that is not synthetic, which I like to use instead um, because of you basically have anemia and this will imp also improve your energy and reduce fatigue. I also am recommending a vitamin K2 drops um, by Thorne because your vitamin D is low. We really want to see optimal levels over 50. This is a little bit more about SIBO. So I'll let you read about that. Some of the SIBO causes that you definitely can relate to. Um, some symptoms here, risk factors, associated complications, like we said, B12 deficiency, anemia, poor absorption of fat, leading to some looser stool. Sometimes it can lead to damage to the intestinal lining, which we'll work on over time. It can lead to osteoporosis, kidney stones. Um, so, and it's associated with a lot of different, um, risk factors and other, other disease processes. This is just an example of how FODMAPs actually are causing the bloating and gas production and distension that's happening. So we have FODMAPs are consumed, right? So these are high carbohydrate foods only. So protein and fats do not contain FODMAPs, only carbohydrates. So they cause delivery of water through the bowel. And then in most people, we don't typically see diarrhea. We can see an alternation of diarrhea and constipation. Um, it really depends on the type of SIBO present, the type of bacteria that are overgrown in the small intestine, but the FODMAPs draw water through the bowel. And then in the large intestine, they produce a lot of gas. And then we see high distension levels, flatulence, abdominal pain, sometimes constipation because of that sluggish upper gut motility. So they're malabsorbed basically. So they can cause uncomfortable symptoms and the highest, um, basically culprits I would say are like wheat pasta, wheat bread, onions, garlic, beans, um, regular milk, apples, honey, mangoes. These are like some of the biggest ones, mushrooms, cauliflower, um, asparagus. So you'll, you know, I'll be going over, I have some, a, a lot of resources that go over the main culprits and I don't expect you to be perfect with it right away. Even at all, we just really want to be swapping out major offenders that we know are huge contributors to this bloating with SIBO. This is my balanced meal formula that I'll be recommending for you to practice, you know, on low FODMAP and beyond to promote healthy blood sugar regulation and overall healthy gut over time and metabolic health and weight loss. So the goal is about half plate non-starchy vegetables. And I'm, I wrote down a bunch here and you'll also be getting a whole low FODMAP vegetable list. Um, many vegetables have a portion size recommended for low FODMAP and many don't. So you'll see the breakdown of that and you're in a PDF. We also want a little serving of healthy fat, um, like about, a, a, I would say like a tablespoon to two tablespoons of a healthy fat. Um, then we want a whole grain on the quarter of the plate. And then we want a, a um, high quality lean protein on another quarter of the plate. And I want you to follow this meal formula for a little bit. And then I'm also going to share with you like a more specific macro plan for you for your weight loss goals but I do want you to get used to the balanced meal formula a little bit first. This is just expanding on that with building a healthy plate um, and just more tips on that, how to have balanced snacks daily as needed. We want to minimize having carb only snacks such as just having a piece of fruit or just having pretzels or chips alone because that is not great for our blood sugar regulation. And when we have high blood sugar and blood sugar spikes and dips throughout the day, it's really hard to have proper gut healing. So we know with your levels being a little higher, we really want to focus in on that with the glucose being elevated. Um, and this is really important, that aspect with importance of a balanced breakfast. So we see here, even in a non-diabetic, our blood sugar can go up with a high carb meal to about 180 even um, an hour after eating and that's in a non-diabetic. So it can be a little, it's likely a little higher for you right now. So we want to make sure that I, I 
from what you've been posting, you do not have like a carb only breakfast. You've definitely been having balanced breakfast, which is amazing. So you want that higher protein, you know, carb containing, but not carb only breakfast that will keep that blood sugar balanced throughout the day and prevent these spikes and dips. And this is typically when we see on that lower end, when we see that fatigue and dips in energy, cravings, sugar cravings, and all that. So this is an example of like a savory breakfast that will not spike blood sugar. You definitely could add a carbohydrate here. Just happen to not have a piece of toast, but like a piece of sourdough toast would be low FODMAP with a few eggs, some spinach, a tablespoon of sauerkraut would be awesome for some probiotics. Just a little bit for now because of SIBO, we don't want to do too, go too crazy on fermented foods, but like an eighth of an avocado, that's probably a little, even too much for FODMAPs. A little bit of raspberries, that is a nice blood sugar balancing breakfast. And I have another whole PDF with a low FODMAP breakfast idea list. And I'll be making for you like a little sample meal plan, um, probably the end of this week or early next week. And I'll send that to you just with some more ideas for low for the low FODMAP um, meal changes. So these are just some more wellness recommendations. You want to try to hydrate before you caffeinate, even making like a mineral mocktail in the morning or really any time of day is nice. I also like to have the mineral mocktails as like an afternoon pick me up for some natural energy to really support the adrenals then instead of, you know, having more caffeine that then pulls from your adrenal glands. I listed some good teas here, some bone broth concentrate I link that's really great for soothing the gut and providing amino acids and collagen intake for healing the gut lining. Kiwi is great for complete bowel movements. Um, I linked a grass-fed collagen that I really like um, to help boost protein intake and help support the gut lining. I listed a little bit more about stomach acid, but I have a whole lesson on that. So I'll have you watch that as well. And I listed some high FODMAP foods sorted into groups here. You don't really need to go crazy with understanding the groups yet. We really would get into that more when we do FODMAP reintroductions. So don't really worry about that right now. But this is a little bit about how to build a low FODMAP meal. So this is even nice to just screenshot and be able to keep this on you when you know, you're know you cooking or you're meal planning. Um, I also do have a blank meal planner in your document section if you want to send it you know, or post in the Facebook group at the beginning of the week for some accountability. That would be amazing. Um, so these are just some more ideas for meal building and just helping you keep a nice variety in your diet. These are an example of portion sizes on FODMAPs, but I'll be helping you with this in your journals as well. You definitely don't need to like memorize portion sizes right now, but some foods are portion size dependent with how bloated they will make you. So if you have, let's say 20 almonds, that can make you get that very bloated feeling. But if you have 10, that keeps the FODMAPs lower and you wouldn't get a reaction. So I'll help you with this. Like I said, you know, we'll troubleshoot this as you post more journals and as you get into the swing of it a little bit more, but there's also, you know, I have a lot of resources in your documents that have portion sizes, as well as this is from that Monash app that I listed earlier in the packet. These are low FODMAP fruits in their portion sizes. Again, another great one to screenshot and keep handy to pair with a protein like almonds or hard boiled eggs or peanut butter. These are some great low FODMAP fiber sources that we really want to keep readily available. Some different flavors to help keep cooking interesting. And I have a lot of recipes for you in your recipe document section, a little low FODMAP Buddha bowl and just some more recipes below. So this is a low FODMAP snack list. I also have a weekly meal prep guide for some things that you can make at the beginning of the week to make it easier for you to stay on track throughout the week. Um, yeah, so a little turmeric tea, and then I have bone broth recipe if you wanted to make your own, um, an, an oatmeal recipe and a smoothie recipe. So that is it for the packet. I'm going to stop sharing. I know it's a lot of information, but I, you know, this is your entire plan laid out for your recommendations for how to heal the gut wholly and completely while, you know, making some of these diet changes, 
ordering some of the supplements that go hand in hand with the diet changes, me sending you the SIBO supplementation that's going to help eradicate the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, as well as reduce candida. Um, but I'm really excited for you. So let me know if you have any questions at all. You know, you have this packet, like I said, you can have this video to come back on, to reflect on and look at any time. So I will talk to you very soon, Erica. Good night.